Hello everyone, today we take a look at German politics since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine because Germany is sometimes um, portrayed as more of a monolith in, in foreign policy and it kind of makes sense from the outside to view just the actions of the German Chancellor but in turn there's quite a lot of differences and for this we have a guest Christoph Bergs who you probably know is military aviation history, but he's a PhD candidate for political science and his thesis is particularly concerned with German policy and everything, so he knows his way around the system. And for this we look at specifically several actors, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, Social Democratic Party, um, the Foreign Minister Baerbeck from the Greens, um, Lamprecht from the Social Democrats, Defense Ministry, Habeck, also from the Greens, um, the Minister for Economics and Climate Affairs, and Marie Agnes Strack Zimmermann from the Liberal Party. She is the chairwoman of the Defense Committee. So, Chris, basically, I think the main um, initial incident or action was the speech by Olaf Scholz, yeah. where he spoke about the Zeitenwende, the shift in times, and a lot of people in international politics were quite surprised by the by the change in course, yep. which then there was, I think, some delay. But internally, there was a lot of going on. So can you give, give us a brief overview of, let's say, the word and actions, because and inactions in a certain way, of the different actors? Yeah, so basically we should remember Germany right now is ruled by a coalition, uh, the Social Democrats, the Liberals and the Greens. And in that coalition, of course, uh, initially when it was uh, came into power, so that was at the end of last year, 2021, it was assumed that it would proceed with a course that is more or less equal to what we had been seeing from Germany before that, right? So uh, 16 years of Angela Merkel, mainly with a grand coalition with the Social Democrats as well, the, uh, the ruling um, party or the, 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 the major uh, component of the grand coalition or the, the coalition that is in currently in power in Germany. And that was the assumption. Then, obviously, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine again. And on the 27th of February, that speech happened from Olaf Scholz. And essentially, when that speech happened, also sort of at the circle of experts on, on German foreign policy and security policy, everybody was very surprised, uh, gobsmacked. And essentially, in one speech, there was not one item that was on the list of all the open questions that Germany had regarding foreign policy and security policy from procurement for the German army, of course, Bundeswehr over to sort of also its alliance with NATO and wasn't sort of ticked off in the sense of, yes, we are now doing everything that we sort of promised we would be doing from the start. Um, and then that, that delay happened that you mentioned and the help, I think uh, we've seen that especially on, on social media, sort of the help that Germany has been given the Ukraine has been i mean we should add here in the beginning there was after the speech immediately um germany started to send weapons at least yes. small weapons so panzerfaust was sent i think strella were sent so uh same missiles and and other aspects and then i think the delay came i think the probably weapons. in march or yeah. something like that so weapons, yeah. so obviously germany before that had also they, there were already these news items that germany had blocked the sending of heavy weapons to but they sent money to, a lot of money yes, mainly before there, even that. There, there was a lot of uh money being sent which is another item we can i guess discuss where that money exactly is going but germany didn't have that reputation of sending weapons or sending any assistance although some of it was helped uh, well, some of it was sent but again, it got that reputation of, oh, it's just sending helmets, right? It's yeah, not yeah. sending weapons and so on. Helmets, yeah. um, and that did switch. Uh, Germany did send quite a lot of weapons. It did then also allow the export of German weapons that were exported to third countries before that, because Germany reserves the right to uh, validate any sort of export of weapons that came from Germany and that were sold to a third party before it be, is, is being uh, sent on. Uh, and... That did then occur. Uh, I think you also made a video about the, the BMP1, uh, BMP yeah. ones that were uh, in, in the Czech Republic, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah, they went from East Germany to Sweden, then to Czech Republic. And yeah, yeah there's a nice graph, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, those things did happen. But then I think sp sending specifically heavy weapons from the German Bundeswehr's arsenal, that was a big question for a long time. 
recently we had that news with Gephardt being sent. But he, but it's in stock. There's a yeah. major difference. Yeah. And and, and that, that's the thing. Like Gephardt is not being in, is, is not in service with the Bundeswehr right now. Um, I think Haus Maffei Wegmann has about 50 in storage. Um, that's the sort of the latest figure I've seen. I don't know if all of them can be put back into action relatively quickly. It's also a question of training. And um, yeah, so that's sort of painting the picture right now from what has happened since the 27th of February, since that, that speech. So, and Olaf Scholz is mainly was on the delay side, but I think Baerbeck specifically pushed on very early on. We need to send weapons all the time. Well, the, from yeah. What I have seen on social media, but you you are the expert. Here. That's the uh, that's the surprising part in in many sense that the Green Party in Germany, um, specifically Annalena Baerbock, our foreign ministry, and um, Habeck, have been pushing very much in the direction of helping Ukraine and taking a tougher line and also getting having Germany be less reliant, especially here with Habeck, on Russian imports of of of, of gas. Uh, Habeck after after uh, Russia attacked. Uh, went to Qatar, for example, to look for uh, the possibility of imports there. I think there were also some other countries that he visited. Um, and it's also interesting that the communication by these different actors of what they're sort of broadcasting on social media and via the media is also very different. So the Greens, generally, you could say also it's a younger party. Annalena Baerbock and Habeck are definitely younger than Olaf Scholz and, and Christine Lambrecht. They are a lot more open with their communication and they're more, more, more transparent of what they're trying to do and also trying to explain that in this position that Germany is in, there are no easy choices and it has to now bite in in the sauren Apfel, as we say in Germany, and in, in, in a sort of... That, that doesn't really translate well into yeah, English. Yeah, a bit of ap apple, yeah, bit yeah, of yeah. apple you, probably. So sort of you, you have to bite the bullet um, yeah. for, for, for a short term now and trying to decrease the reliance on Russian imports because of, of course, the governmental line that Germany has been following for uh, more than 16 years now with the, uh, with the uh, most recently with the, of course, uh, government of Angela Merkel, but before that, of course, also of Gerhard Schröder, who was a social democrat, and that brings it back around to now, because in the SPD as well, and this is actually a component in discussion as well, the position of Gerhard Schröder and sort of this old friendly uh, relation that was tried to be maintained with Russia is keeps on being an issue. He's, he's the former chancellor of Germany yeah. and he is now an executive or even the, the chair of, of some gas from... Yeah, he's, he's, he, he has... <laughs> he was given after, after he... Uh, it was no longer German chancellor. He, he, he went over to Russia and, and, and got a, a very good job there um, from the Russian energy companies. Yeah, Gazprom, yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, the, it now looks that the SPD is going in the direction of actually excluding him from the party. We don't know if that's actually going to happen. There have been some calls for yeah, that. There's a discussion for ages now. There's a been dis calls for yes. it. Yeah. I mean, there have been calls for this for, for a number of years now, but now it's starting to get a bit more serious. But you do see that internal divide, not just in the coalition between the SPD, the, the Liberals and the Greens on how hardcore you might want to say uh you uh, what, what sort of line you want to run against russia and how much you want to help ukraine and with what you want to help ukraine but as well as that you see that division inside the social democrats of where germany should now be heading towards and you have that old you could say maybe the sort of the older demographic of the party who do want uh, stress more about dialogue with Russia, who try to maintain some sort of friendly relations, who always stress the need for negotiations, although they do so in a, in a, in a especially from a sort of a public uh, communication standpoint, in a very poor manner. Um, and then you have sort of other elements in the party who are more active in saying, no, no, we have to now be more harsh on Russia. We have to support Ukraine. And yes, we have made mistakes in the past. And there's also Magni Marie Agnes Strack-Zimmermann, the chairman of the De Defense Committee. Yeah. There's also quite some discussion around her from what I've seen. I think she was quite vocal on social media because of, uh, several times she popped up and basically said, well, don't talk. I don't talk ab about your stuff and you don't talk about my stuff, I think. So, so can you give us a bit more information on her? Be because I guess she showed up on other news feeds as well. So... 
If yeah. Better so so Marie-Agnes Schack-Zimmermann, she is the chairperson, as you said, from the Defense Committee. The Defense Committee of the Bundestag is sort of a specialized committee. There's multiple uh, specialized committees that just deals in this question with defense. So they also advise their own parties and the parliament on matters of defense. And in that role, she has been very active, uh, also trying to support Ukraine. She has been on that side of, well, we have to send assistance to Ukraine that Ukraine can use immediately. So she had, for example, also a discussion with the uh, Ukrainian ambassador to Germany, Andriy Melnyk, where they were talking, for example, about the possibility of sending heavy weapons. And there she, she said, Look, we, we, we would like to do it, but your soldiers have to be trained on these weapon systems. We cannot just send anything uh, to, towards, uh, towards the Ukrainian army and then just Hope that it magically yeah. works, right? And she is very vocal in, in in sort of social media and also on in on in the media platform in in Germany. And I think that's where we especially see that difference between the politicians who take a very proactive stance, which we are not used to seeing from oftentimes German politicians, and the ones who are a little bit more reactive, or on the flip side, maybe if you want to put their perspective in this, a more measured, uh, in 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 waiting until you know for sure what you can do. But in this circumstance, I think it really does appear oftentimes that this more measured, more reactive approach appears, especially to foreign observers, as Germany is always going to do the right thing after it has been left with no alternative. Yeah. Right. And and here here's a short explanation about Im sending immediate action and delayed action. So basically General Rohrschneider explained this in an interview. You have a lot or less now um, former Warsaw Pact inventory yeah so germany had some from from the Na uh, national Volksarmee, yeah. from the national people's army from the gdr previously so like the bmp1 that was then sent uh, was lately in czechia and then they had also the strella and and the aircraft missiles and for instance poland has t-72s and and various variants so since the ukrainian army uses t-72s strella bmps and all the other stuff we can just send them the equipment from, from former stock and they can use it generally immediately. Because, and sometimes this is also upgraded. For instance, I'm, I'm not sure in what condition the T-72s from the Polish uh, mm. forces were, but I assume they were upgraded. Although we should consider usually the Soviet Union had T-72s and they had the C-72M, which was the export version, which generally was weaker. And generally yeah. those were sent to the Warsaw Pact because even internally in the Warsaw Pact, it didn't give away the best equipment usually. So there's always a bit difference. A T-72 is not a T-72. I mean, there are, I think, 20 or 40 variants. You can just look on Wikipedia and like scroll down and, and, <laughs> and then there's different version of that. So, and then there's the non-immediate action where you basically you provide different equipment like the MADA, um, infantry fighting vehicle or the Leopard where there needs to be some training done, yep. at least for several weeks, even if it's an experienced person, because as, se as several people pointed out, of course, you can train someone on a leopard in six weeks, but then he is able to use that vehicle. But the question is, how combat effective is he yep. after six weeks? Because this also in, in combat, seconds can determine life or death. Yep. So that can make a major difference because... There's, if you're really well trained on a tank, there's this one nice example um, I, I got in Puka in the museum. They said like, when the old people come in, there's, there's two things that are very interesting. First off, if they were trained on a Sherman, every tank for them is a Sherman. If they were trained on a T-72, every tank for them is a T-72. But the other thing is, sometimes these people can barely walk. But when you let them on the tank, they just slip in this, in, in this, in, in this small hatch and that agile and everything, where you as a young guy always hit your head. And, and, and you just, he, he was like, the guy was, I, I'm amazed every time again, how these people just, because it's in their muscle memory, everything mm -hmm. is there, even after decades later. And this is where, where the, the fluency and training and everything comes in. Mm -hmm. And this is very important. You, you get this after several weeks, but it depends on the situation and everything. And you ideally want to have this with a vehicle. And if they were trained in Ukraine, I think they had a lot of, a lot of trained people because since 2014, I think they shifted around 
on the front line. So a lot of people are experienced with the different material. And for their BMP2s and, and BMP1s and T70s, they usually know how, how this works. And you don't, and in a, yeah, in a tank, you bump your head or everything else rather fast. And it can even put you out of action if you're too fast yeah. and hit your head. So that, that makes sense. That is not some, 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 um, unimportant concern. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think, uh, actually today I, I read an article about the training that the German army has been given the Romanian army on gear part, uh, several years back, uh, I believe the the uh, the uh, person that was actually overseeing the training, that person said it took about nine months for the Romanian crews to be proficient enough to call them. You know, now you're capable of operating the device, but that was sort of the sort of really. The, I wouldn't say the basic training because that sounds harsh, yeah. but it, it's 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 not that you are full on. That you have that muscle memory that you were talking about, where you just instantaneously you're like, no, you can operate a vehicle, but you 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 still have a lot of training to uh, to go towards. To of course, that was done during peacetime. Yeah, I, I you... guess there, there's also the formation training coming in. Yeah. So basically, it's a, the basic thing of training is first you train one guy, then you train like the squad. I mean, in this case, it's one guy on a tank, and usually in a tank you have a redundancy. So in, for instance, Jens Wiener. As you might know, I'm um, link here. He was trained mainly as a driver, but he was also able to operate at the, the gunnery system of the Leopard. So, and I think mo at least in the Wehrmacht, for instance, everyone was trained as a driver. Mm. And I think it might be at least, I assume even in the Leopard, that at least two guys were trained as a driver. Driver must be also to, uh, to perform a minor uh, maintenance and, and repair minor, minor damage as well. So in a tank. And then... But then you have only the tank crew trained. Then you train the tank platoon. So three to four tanks to intake. And then comes the company. Yeah. And I think the Gepard is probably the most complicated system yeah. because the Gepard provides for armored formation air defense. Yeah. So he, he must, it must coordinate with, with the, with, I generally assume that it's attached to a battalion properly. Mm -hmm. So, then you have to have probably a whole tank battalion ready and train with them and everything. So it's a bit more complicated there. Then, of course, there's some, um, not sure, depends in Germany or something. You often have like um, leadership training and all the other stuff. That, for instance, for Ukraine can yet generally be, well, be ignored for a while now. And, and of course, it was peacetime training, so it was also likely a bit more... Um, um, yeah, more leisure, I guess, because I, I assume that your, all the Ukrainians probably would also insist, okay, you, you can train us faster or something like, I mean, you can do double shifts to a certain degree and all that stuff. You can well. also make also the, the sort of the argument of saying, well, the Ukrainians, they, they have experience with Tunguska and, and, yeah. and these weapon systems. But the thing is, that does help in the way that you can conceptualize the use of Gepard, because essentially it's, it's the analog. But you also have to unlearn Tunguska yeah. as you're learning Gepard. And the systems are completely different. And it is not that you, just because you know Tunguska, you can immediately jump in the Gepard and just drive off and, and, and shoot down, you know, a Sukai 34 or something. It, it just doesn't work that way. Um, and I think to round this back to the German discussion, I mean, when, when it comes to, to the heavy weapons delivery, even though everybody was sort of pressing on Germany to, to send heavy weapons, it wasn't the only country I think you could say that had these discussions but because of the central role that it has in europe it is def and because of also the sort of the the reputation it has and and in the past like you know strategic decisions it has made to of make, becoming reliant on on russian uh, gas imports and so on it of course has that special role where the lens is on germany of sending assistance and then you have this this divide between german politicians who are very active in trying to promote help for Ukraine and those that just seem to wait and wait and wait and eventually when it appears like they have no other choice anymore then they make their decision but that just might be the uh, the uh, the conclusion out of inner party disputes on these aspects as well as trying to maintain sort of cohesion in the coalition and trying to really understand and, and evaluate the options that they have so 
Yeah, it's, it, it, it's quite a fascinating um, sort of dynamic within the German government right now. And it's moving in the direction, really, you, we should definitely be saying it's moving in the direction of reducing reliance on Russia tremendously and also increasing the help to Ukraine where it can. And if you look at sort of the exports that have gone to Ukraine, both in terms of humanitarian help, as well as weapon systems from small arms over to now Gepard, when that is happening, when they are being, of course, sent there, the training still has to happen and the, the ammunition still has to be found as well. Once that has occurred, Germany doesn't stand too badly in terms of the volume of stuff that has been sent. In terms of GDP, that's maybe another discussion again. Yeah, it's quite complicated. I mean, yeah. for the heavy weapons, you should also add, there are sometimes people compare um, apples to oranges. Yeah. For instance, the United States, from what I know, I think the first sent... 18 M triple sevens and then another 72. Mm -hmm. That that's artillery. That's lightweight artillery before due to use of titanium, but uh, the caliber is 155 millimeters. Now Germany was criticized for not sending the Panzer bitte 2000. Has the same caliber, but this is a, a vehicle with 50 tons. Yeah. Meanwhile, the US hadn't sent, from what I know by now, um, ne no self-propelled artillery of the M109 category, and I think no other country. It has sent something similar, except former Russia Pact, the 2S1 Gotvitska, I think. Yeah. I think Czechia or Slovenia and or Poland sent, and I'm, I'm not sure now because, well, we're in a hotel. I don't have access to uh, my information right now. So they were sent and they were already also in service in the Ukrainian army. So uh, the French are sending Caesar now as well. Yeah, the yeah. French are sending yeah. Caesar now, of course. Yeah, mm. that that shift. Yeah, 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 I forgot it. Good that you pointed it out. And the Dutch with the Panzerbits as well. Yeah, but, I mean that's yeah. the, the German one. So yeah. the Dutch sent theirs, and from what I know, I think the number was confirmed now with five, and yeah. the German seven. So now you have twelve, which actually makes sense because generally a battery of Panzerbitsen was in Germany previously three, and now four. Yeah. And then probably, I, I had a discussion with someone on, on, on Twitter, he mentions he probably go with a battery of three, so they have four batteries because they have more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Because it's also a quite a powerful system if everything works. As pointed out in my video where I explain all the, the capabilities and uh, possible ways to, to put it to action. Yeah. So I think we covered nearly everything. I mean, we just can talk, I mean, think shortly about Friedrich Merz, who is the leader of the Consultative Party, yeah. and, and he visited um, Kiev. Yes, he did. So uh, there were already a couple of German politicians that had visited Ukraine before. Magni Marie Agnes Schack Zimmermann was one of them. Uh, I think Hofreiter from the Green Party as well. And there was one third politician, I think, from the SPD, whose name escapes me now, uh, sadly. Um, they already visited uh, Ukraine a couple of weeks before. And that event was interesting in a way because when they came back they sort of increased their calls for assistance to Ukraine which was also severely then criticized by a certain element within the German um, political circle ignoring now the extreme fringes of AfD and Die Linke who both seem to be quite content in in supporting well may, may not supporting Ukraine let's say um, but uh, <laughs> yeah that's <impressive. laughs> Uh, but but also within the SPD or, or some German intellectuals as well in the German discussion, there was some calls, you know, these, these people just want to escalate the war as if the war hasn't escalated already. Um, but where, where, with Friedrich Merz now coming over, that, that actually is a very interesting example because Scholz has not visited Ukraine just yet. And he's one of the few people, if you, for example, look at Boris Johnson from the UK, He's been over there. He's uh, spoken with President Zelensky. I mean, that might have even uh, domestic issues. Yes, there, of course. There was this meme, thank you for saving my career. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I mean, uh, that must not be forgotten as well. But the reason why Scholz, or it's not really full on the reason, but it's one of the reasons why Scholz hasn't really been able to visit Ukraine yet. To some regards, that is because our the German president, who is... Not Scholz. Scholz is the chancellor. The president is more of a symbolic figure, but he is the head of state. The president is has had planned a visit to Ukraine and was sort of uninvited by the Ukrainian side. Although the versions of that story differ depending on who you ask, and having the head of state uninvited, it doesn't really allow Scholz then to go 
to yeah. Ukraine. I mean, you could, you could get over this, but it's, it's, it's one of those political things. And again, in the, in the social Democrats, there was a little bit of, you know, the, the undiplomatic term would be a hissy fit uh, for, uh, over, over this, right? Um, but Friedrich Merz now being over there, uh, seems to have, at least he likes to position himself as this, and he, he sent out a tweet in the sense of, oh, well, now that I've been to Ukraine, I'm, I'm happy to announce that Schultz can come as well and so on. We, we, we came to this agreement with President Zelensky and, 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 and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's of course also done for domestic gain. Just like with Boris Johnson there, you also have to keep the domestic component in, 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 in view there. Uh, also should be mentioned, Friedrich Merz is, is rather huge, he, uh, he, tall, he's 198, so almost two meters, because I, I saw pictures of him and Zelensky and I was like, this, did, did somebody put him on a chair or something? <laughs> and no, no, he's, he's really, and, and now I looked up on Wikipedia, I was like, is this, yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, if you wonder about the photos, if you see one huge dude that looks German next to Zelensky, that's probably Merz. Yeah, that uh, would be him. I think we covered, or is there something you want to add? No, I think we covered everything. A little bit disconjointed, but I think we covered everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we just, just for a little bit of context, we just signed all, or we signed this, uh, the Stucker books. So, and they will be sent out soon. And so we, after a journey of more, more year now, yeah. we are quite happy, but also a bit Tires. under the water. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Big thank you here, Chris. Thank you very much for having me. And yeah, thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye. See ya.